Hi there, guys, and welcome to Road Less Traveled, a podcast by Applewood Distillery, where we talk to all the people in the booze industry and across the industry in general who are pushing the boundaries in their field. And today we're joined by a really awesome guest and a guest who doesn't, for my money, get enough airtime. It's our distiller, Mitch Galvin. Mitch, welcome. What's going on, mate? How you doing? Uh, it's very kind of you to say on the way in. I think I get more than enough airtime, but happy to contribute some more. Wait, why, why do you think you get enough airtime? Oh, it's people drinking our stuff, mate. I don't. That's I, all see, the I don't. I don't view that as airtime, though. Like that's, <laughs> that's not like you actually having a platform to talk about what you do. Because I feel like everyone, like people who do drink our stuff, obviously get to, I suppose, uh, indulge in your work uh, maybe every day if if they like it like that. But mostly you I, and me, yeah. Mo- yeah, mostly yeah. us. But I feel like you don't get enough of a platform to actually talk about what you do and talk about your story and where you're from and where you've just come back from as well, having just gone to Japan. Yes, yeah, right. Which right. happy to share. Dope. That yeah. was great. So, yeah. so my my first question for you, because not a lot of people will know this story, is how did you actually first get into distilling? So it was in it was working in bars for, for quite a long time, well, kind of like most of my career, and uh, Applewood was always my favourite gin which uh, isn't just me saying that, it's true, dead set. They, they had it yeah. cooking already. And then, uh, yeah, I was working at a cocktail bar uh, down in town in Adelaide and I saw that I'd come up for the cellar door manager position and uh, I'd already done a little bit of education in distilling, so I had some, uh, you know, a bit of my eye on maybe what could happen uh, if I took that job and then what else that could lead to. So I took the job as a cellar door manager, was lucky enough to get it. Obviously loved it here and loved the people. And then uh, they had to still quit and uh, got a bit of a surprise um, kind of, promotion i guess to to distilling and then jumped out the back and through the good graces of you and brendan and and kind of some good luck it, it's gone around for the past three years and, and yeah that's how i ended up here so was I, I did have a question for you which was like what is your scariest moment that you had in distilling is that one of them like was that a was that a really fearful moment for you when you had to step into that because they were big they were big shoes to fill mm. and we're, we're not a like, I think a lot of people view us as a small distillery in traditional terms, but we're like, in terms of production levels, we're not, we're not producing a small amount of spirit anymore, which is great, but it does mean that there's a lot of responsibility that, that falls on you to make it. And yeah, was, was sure. that, was that your, like, was that one of your scariest moments or like a moment of trepidation or is there another moment in distilling so far where you've been like, Oh, all this is a bit gnarly. Well, yeah, I guess it's been different kinds of fear i guess like getting getting that job like you, you think you want your dream job until you, you get given your dream job <laughs> it's <laughs> kind of like it's kind of like meeting your hero you're like oh, yeah, this I was like, a bad idea uh, maybe not me um so yeah i came into it with a, with a bit of doubt and quite a bit of fear and like uh, yeah when brendan first offered it to me it was kind of like oh just had like we do an idea like pitch it out wildly and i, I it's like what i would have thought my reaction would be like absolutely i was like can i think about that for a bit that might not be maybe the best idea but yeah that was that was pretty terrifying and then i don't know if it more like a more like a safety fear that i had once was our condenser shut down once mid distillation run so I can't. Wait, why why is your condenser shutting down a problem for, the, for uh, those people who've never distilled before in their life why yeah, is your sure. condenser so, shutting down a problem so basically what you're doing is you're boiling that the the kettle that is the, the still so you're effectively making all this alcoholic vapor which is highly explosive but obviously it's contained within the still and then the condenser is cool water that you'll run kind of alongside it that'll cool it down take it back into a liquid slash that's what your gin is um mm. yeah. so the condenser shuts down instead of having like nice cold gin flowing out of your still you get um like really hot highly explosive steam bursting out of the end of your still and uh I was in the other room and I just heard this like glass shatter because we have little sight glass like parrot things on top and it had um, like, I don't know if it had popped it off and out or if it had just exploded it from pressure. Um, it was just like steam pissing everywhere. And so it was a bit of a race to shut the steel down and then try and fix the condenser. And that was probably the scariest because we hadn't really had an emergency in this distillery before. <laughs> like it all gone relatively smoothly <laughs> to that point. Yeah. Um, so I was, I was slightly nervous about that. Um, yeah, but, for sure. Because you, uh, yeah. you'd effectively created a, a bomb yeah yeah it made things a little bit dicey um so you know aired the whole thing out and told everyone what was going on but um thankfully caught it pretty early thankfully that glass exploded you know, it might have been in the other room for a yeah. little bit too long but yeah yeah, so, yeah. yeah that was uh that was otherwise thrilling. we would have otherwise we would have had to tell one of those stories that's so similar to scotch whiskey you know mythology which is like and then in this year the still no the, the distillery <laughs> burnt down 
Yeah, it's like we started. Why did we get the new stills? Oh, funny, you should ask. The other ones <laughs> melted. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, oh, thankfully not one of those. But, yeah, man. We keep it dicey so, around here. I love it. I love, we don't keep it dicey. Di- no, I know. So, you edit keep that. You edit that bit. We don't. Actually, it's usually that. so, cut so that, safe. Cut that. <laughs> yeah. Take safety cut very that. seriously. Yeah. We do take safety really seriously. That 100%. is. We want Maybe everyone to know that we're. 100%. Yes. Well. You are the you are the safety champion at the distillery. Mm. That's These are safety I'm glasses. You can't shatter them. You can unlike the glass that alerted you to the condenser exactly shutting right. down. Exactly right. I love that. So mm-hmm. if there are people at home who maybe have been drinking gin for a really long time, um, and they they know a little bit about gin, but maybe they've glossed over kind of the basics of what gin is. Asking you, like, what is gin for you? Uh well, in terms of like what it is like from an objective standpoint, rather than dive straight in what it is for me, uh, it's an alcoholic beverage that's at least 37.5% ABV and uh, with juniper being the predominant botanical. So that's like, but that's kind of the interesting thing about gin is that that's like the only definition for the most part, particularly around here. Um, which means that for me, it's really like a pretty awesome vehicle for creativity because you're making it straight away. It's not like scotch or, or brandy or anything like that where you've got to, got to barrel it down for for x amount of years it's just like you basically put stuff in the in the still and then you make it and then like once it's made you have effectively the thing so it's a really great great way to kind of create things and and mix things together and and basically do whatever you want by stuff what what specifically do you mean by we we put the stuff in yeah yeah for for those people out there who are like put the stuff in Okay. Yeah, you got to whack stuff in. Stuff is first and foremost. Um, so yeah. obviously juniper. Uh, but yeah, but then that's kind of the point I guess I was getting at. Is the stuff can be pretty much anything you want it to be. So for us, obviously, that's in large part native Australian botanicals. That's like our, our thing and that's our ethos. And that's the stuff we ought to explore because it's not necessarily been explored to the depths that we're trying to explore. It. But, you know, you go anywhere around the world and that stuff is all kinds of different things, whether it be local things or whether it be more traditional stuff like oris and you know, coriander seed and oranges and things like that. Mm, yeah, for sure. And our, and so what then is gin to you? Is it that creative vehicle then for you to like express flavor? Like what, what is gin to you and, and why? I know that you have come into this role and like we make gin. So you probably didn't have a choice to be mm. like, you know what guys, big, big change. We're going to make agave spirit now. Um, yeah. but what, what about gin for you is an effective vehicle to convey the obvious creativity that you have? It's kind of you to say, um, yeah, I guess, as I said, kind of that immediacy of it and, uh, and, you know, regardless of whether I would have, you know, wanted to do a garbage spirit or what have you, Applewood gin was always my favorite gin, as I said. So it's kind of always held a place as a really good way of directly influencing a product if that makes sense it's like which is i guess that's a bit of a nebulous thing to say but like you know like you make a wine and you and you kind of let it ferment and you and you do and it does its thing for the most part and you've got you know green yeah. grapes whatever whatever may have you know yeah doing, so i'm not gonna break down how wine goes <laughs> you can tell i spent a bit of time out in the production uh, so yeah it's basically it's gonna do its thing you can influence it one way or another but for the most part it's it's picking its own course and that's how you get that sense of terroir or you know even like the profile of the wine is dictated in large part by the grapes and then somewhat the process while gin is i think in large part dictated by your choice of ingredients and then the process that you do to them so i think it's a more direct expression of whether you want to express place or whether you want to express your personal you know preferences or whether you want to express what you think the market will like that's all i guess up to the person making it as long as you kind of know what you're doing um and i think that's what's what makes it exciting and that's why it's obviously taken off to the extent that it has Mm. and obviously you distill a lot of different things in your every day do you Mm. have a favorite botanical and if so if you can't like name your favorite do you have like a top three or a top five that you you've either worked with or are working with at the moment where you're like oh my goodness, this ingredient is next level. I think I've come back around on desert limes. Obviously we use desert limes a lot. Like, okay, you've, you've come back around. So I've come back around. I was never, I was never, so I was never out on desert limes. Like when I first experienced them, I was like, oh, it tastes like sour salt. That's kind of cool. And then I was like, when you're just making your products and stuff, kind of left them by the wayside. because I was like, we use them a lot. And then I kind of enjoy that confected marmalade flavor that you get when you, uh, when you distill desert limes traditionally, but then having recently got a rotary evaporator still, as you and I have played with, um, 
then getting the kind of the full expression of the full desert lime flavor kind of made me think again about what it could be and how it can be used. Um, you, can you quickly, just before you go on, can you explain the mm -hmm. difference between traditional distillation and a rotary evaporator and exactly what that is? Yeah, for sure. Um, so traditional distillation, as, as was kind of hinted at in our safety briefing, is you're boiling an alcoholic kettle effectively. So you've got a mixture of ethanol and water and the stuff that's in there. Uh, you're going to boil that. Very yeah, yeah. The, yeah, the stuff is staying around. It's for everybody, man. It's E for everybody, this podcast. Um, and then you're going to condense that back down into a liquid, um, and that's how you get your alcoholic beverage for the most part. So to do that, you have to heat it to at least, you know, 78.4 degrees to get the uh, ethanol to evaporate, and alcohol, ethanol, uh, that'll evaporate. Uh, so you're obviously heating up to at least that extent, and then as you get less alcohol in that liquid, you have to heat it more and more to keep it boiling. What you're doing with a rotary evaporator still is effectively the exact same process, but you're doing it under a vacuum. So you bring it down to, I guess, as close to zero bar as you can, going from one, obviously, being Earth's atmosphere. And by lowering the atmospheric pressure around your boiling mixture, uh, it'll reach its boiling point way lower in terms of real temperature. So you end up being able to distill at a much cold, cooler temperature, which means you don't have to literally cook your botanicals or stuff. Uh, in the still so it means you can get a kind of more full expression of the flavor awesome. or at least a different so, one yeah so you <laughs> yeah. come back around to desert lime was that mm. did you come back around to desert lime off the back of vacuum distillation or did you come around to desert lime before that and then the rotary evaporator or the vacuum still gave you kind of another way to to paint the picture uh, if well, we're going along with this artistic analogy yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you on that. And yeah, it did, I think it did. Like I was kind of, I was backing on it from the Wild Basil gin. It had a bit of a bit of a run in Wild Basil, which I thought it was really doing, a, doing some pretty exciting things. And it was one of those classics. So I was like, you know, agonizing over the recipe. And then someone was like, well, someone, Brendan. Brendan. Uh, I was like, oh, you should maybe try the desert line in that. And I was like, yeah, I guess I could, you know, humor the boss. And uh, like tick the box. And then from there, I've been, uh, you know, getting back in on it as like a, as a key piece of the puzzle or the key, a key, you know, freaking color on my palette or what have you for the artistic people out there. Uh, and then the rotary evaporator definitely kind of opened it back up to me in terms of like, you can get the full depth of flavor depending on which kind of method you want to go with. And I think it kind of opens it up to be whether or not you want it to be your feature citrus or like a key sweetening agent or whatever have you in your recipe. I think that makes it really exciting. Yeah. Awesome. And what, so desert lime is an ingredient that you've come around to. So, mm. So since desert lime is an ingredient that you've come around to, um, what are, what are some others that you've been distilling with either recently or a long time ago that are in your kind of like top five? Top five. Um, huge on wild basil again, and still have been, I've been out of quit it since I first had it, which, what do we put yeah, that in the table like for in first? Like, oh, yeah, I'm just, I'm obsessed. The botanicals once you pop yeah, it, yeah. stop. A hundred percent in that, and in that same vein, gel from wax, uh, yeah. which like you, you and I both are addicted to. Just if you, if you need something, if it needs a little something, you know that something is 90% of the time. Mm. It's going to be gel from wax. It's going to be gel from uh, wax, right? It's, it's such be, it's a gotta... good ingredient. It's such a mm. good ingredient because it, it distills like Skittles for me. Like 100%. it gives me this really nostalgic, this really nostalgic element of, of Skittles, like an open packet of Skittles. It just reminds me of that so much. Um, I think you're bang what on. What about... Yeah. What, what about wild basil for you is just so inviting and so exciting? Yeah. So I kind of like, I can't even remember what the first time we got samples of it uh, were, but it was well before, like it was maybe a year and a bit ago. And just, uh, it has this kind of really unique, like lushness to it. It's probably the best word I could give it. Um, it's kind of like a really kind of rich, creamy mintiness. It's just a, I'm throwing just random adjectives out, out the wall here. Yeah. But yeah, it's like effectively got this really like kind of like Henry, Henry, mate, have you uh, ever had a grasshopper, mate? Yeah, you know the cocktail of the grasshopper. Yes, yeah, <laughs> you familiar with that drink? It's, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah like, it's, it's like chalk mint ice cream. It's chalk, yeah, so exactly right. We got creme de menthe, we got cream. Basically, that's all you need mm. to make a great cocktail. Um, underrated classic. Mm. So I consider it has a little bit of that kind of richness to it, while also still being like minty, a little bit spicy, nice and savory. Um, yeah, it's just a really unique flavor. And I think one that like kind of controls the gin really nicely. Yeah. Awesome. And were there, were there two more? I asked for your top five. So what, oh, what are the other right. two? So we've got, we've had desert lime so far. Mm -hmm. We've had Geraldton wax because my God, Geraldton wax is possibly one of the greatest native Australian ingredients known to man. And then 100%. we've had wild basil again, probably one of our youngest native Australian ingredients because uh, we believe it was introduced uh, in 1200 BC. 
sorry, no, oh my God, no. We believe it was introduced in the year 1200 to Australia, mm. which is really, really cool. So what are the what are the other two? And they can be non-native, they can be native, wh whichever, uh, you know, really speak to you that you've been distilling recently. Mm. Yeah, you're going to have to edit out some silence here while I have a good old think. Uh, I have yeah. a good old think, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll have a good, good, good ponder. Because I think I can throw two out there that, like, you have told me that you've loved. Please. I'm out Passion of Passion fruit mind, marigold. So. Passion oh, fruit dude. marigold. Mate, how am I missing that? Oh, no, not marigold. It is, man. It's the go. It's, uh, yeah. No, nah, it's, uh, and that's another one that the, the Rotary Apparatus still has been, been sick for, basically. Um, yeah. just sling that through on its own is Passiona, which it's like taking every, every ounce of my restraint to not just take it home as a, as a little, uh, present, little present for Mitchie. Dude, it's so next level. It's just mm. one of my favorite. It's one of my favorite ways to use a Rotary Apparatus because under, under heat, it just cooks, it cooks the leaves and then they mm. turn into this weird, bitter passion. Fruit. They kind of turn into like marijuana weed. It's, it, it does it get almost dang. smells like, yeah, it really yes. just starts to smell like Snoop Dogg in the mm. distillery and like no one, no one needs that. You know what I mean? Like, no, we already have whole time for that. We don't need that. Uh, yeah, America. exactly. We, we have something have Native Australian for that. Time. 100%. Yeah. If, mm. if I want to make everyone smell like they've been, you know, hotboxing the distillery all day, we'll just distill mm. wild thyme. Exactly right. Oh, sure. Oh, oh, it's like, it's almost too much. You know mm. what I mean? Yeah. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. And then the other one, the other one, which I know, I know it blew your mind, was Carolina Reaper. That absolutely floored me. And yeah, it's, uh, I was reticent to mention it because we haven't done anything with it yet. Uh, cool. in terms no, of you no, know, this, gearing it we're just throwing back the curtain here baby oh yeah, yeah. If, if, wanna, if you want to know if you want to know what we've been playing with uh it was and that's uh actually that brings us back to the start of our discussion of things that terrified me in the distillery it was when you freaking yeah, brought seriously? in those dude you well Why like did that terrify you because we had to wear oh, hazmat equipment yeah we had to do it before hazmat we're blitzing it up we're heating it up and as much as we're like not heating it up as much as you might you know we're obviously uh removing everything so yeah, I'm sorry for the people that might not know, like effectively when we're distilling the Carolina Reapers, you're basically extracting everything from them except for the capsaicin, which is the bit that makes it uh, so spice. Uh, and then obviously the result of that is that you're going to have something left in your still, which is effectively concentrated capsaicin, uh, which is like pepper yeah. spray. Um, yeah, which like I'll, yeah, which like, I'm not even good with spicy foods, so I wasn't necessarily super excited to get like full riot geared, um, <laughs> you know, get the full treatment. It was uh, genuinely so, so funny watching you dispose of that like someone mm. out of Chernobyl. It oh, was... I was dead serious. I was not messing around <laughs> yeah, at yeah. all. And I know no. some people could like, ah, whatever happens, I'm like, I would be the person that would like touch this and then like touch my eye and then like go to the bathroom and then like it would just be an absolute. So I was I was taking every precaution. There was there's gloves and there's gloves yeah. that were thrown out. There's gloves within gloves and yeah, it was all yeah, gloves within gloves. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. <laughs> And those gloves have been like left in a place. They've still not been touched. They've still not no. been. Yeah, it's yeah. just like Chernobyl. It's the, like the firefighter outfits left in the basement. They're still there. One hundred percent. I've got um some like two meter long tongs on back order to handle with those gloves, but like it's taking quite a while to get them in here. Yeah. But, yeah. No, no, uh, but it was awesome. It's so so cool. So obviously, uh, yeah. the good the good aspect of that is the stuff that you distill is like this thing that smells like it's going to hurt you so badly, but it's instead just like really like. The thing you'd never really notice about chilies when you smell them is that they're so like tropical and fruity and it's like such a bright, yeah, I guess tropical uh, aroma. And then that carries through on the flavor because you're not getting, you know, bombarded with, with heat. Yeah. The, the big thing for me was tasting it. And I remember tasting it with Noah, who's on the Wine for the People podcast, for those of you at home mm. who want to check him out. Um, and he was tasting it and said that it tasted like, uh, like confected watermelon, like the fake watermelon flavor. It's a really good call. It's such a shout. That's money. It's yes. such a shout. I just loved it. I loved it. That was, that was a great one. And, uh, I want to go back there. Oh, mate, come on, mate. I'll send you some. I'll send you some. Yeah. Well, yeah. No, funnily, enough, funnily enough, there's a takeover that may be happening in Sydney in a couple of weeks mm. um, with Applewood Distillery. Uh, it hasn't been confirmed yet, so I can't like spruik it. Or it may be confirmed, and I really want to use that alongside Oka Bitter. Oh, yeah, 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 up the tropical. So tropical. I like this. Tropical fruit, up the tropical, like yeah, yeah. Yeah, tropical aperitivo, but with Carolina Reaper and Okamina. Uh, I feel like it would just be a vibe. I'm liking this. Absolute I'm, vibe. 
Damn. I'm about to send something to whip back my way, man. That sounds Mate, bloody delicious. I'll, I'll, ba- I'll bag it up for you. And bag it up. At least send me the specs, you know? Like, yeah, hey, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, you can just distill some up any time. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. I have the stuff. Just give me the specs. But yeah, my God, yeah, yeah. that sounds uh, sounds pretty damn fun. So, so just to just to go back to it, your top five, Desert mm. Lime, mm. Wild Basil, mm. Geraldton Wax. Geraldton Wax. And do we you agree that. with my other two, that Passion Fruit Marigold and Carolina Reaper? If we're going like at the moment, at the moment, yeah, yeah, like like when you're some of their favorite songs, it's like this is what I'm liking yeah. right now. Yeah. I'm not going to give it all time until I retire, and then it'll be like a big thing. That we, yeah, but yeah, that's what's yeah, top that's... in the, the the top 100 this this year. That's the yeah, that's the yeah, top yeah, five, yeah. the top 100. I love it. Hundred hundred percent. But dude, what are you what are you working on now? Like if I I like I know when I was there when I was at the distillery last week, you had a mm. few cheeky samples of like leopard wood and yeah you, you had a few other crazy things on the go like what's what's on the what's on the r&d plate this week uh r and i'm still yeah i'm kind of playing with this um with this which you can cut this out if i'm spilling trade secrets about maybe Fine. maybe uh tropicaling up okar tropic a little bit mm. um kind of adding a little bit of a distillate to there using the already evaporator still which i'm really excited about and um, leopard wood's one of those ones that's really kind of jumped out as being it's like this really interesting musky flavor which is not what you necessarily expect from a leaf uh, and a flower. So we, that's been pretty interesting. So we're playing with a bit of leopard, leopard wood, a little bit of passion fruit marigold, some uh, gentian root. What else do we have? There might be some pineapple sage in there as well, which is not, not a really fun one. Uh, and then just on like the random asides that we're doing, I'm playing with uh, a little bit of sea parsley, um, with some leopard wood, um, desert lime making an appearance again, uh, a few other things. Nice yeah, nice yeah you got to have it in there. Got to have it in there. Yeah. Um, as well as, uh, yeah, some stellar and cucumber and things like that. I'm just trying to make something super green, but not uh, obnoxiously green, which is, this is absolutely not a teaser for those Applewood fans out there that might be waiting on the next product. That is just yeah. me playing. I'm just, <laughs> I've just got a little bit of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, this is how we end up with eventually a good idea. The distillery crayons out and you're, you're oh, having a hundred feet. I like to call it tinkering in my little potions. Yeah. That's, Tink- that's what I do. Tinkering your little potions. Yeah, I get my little potions like out that. and I do a little tinker. Yeah. Just yeah, yeah. doing a Professor Snape. 100% man and then that's a fun thing with rotary evaporator as well it's a big spinning orb so I sit there and I ponder that a little bit and I'll you know, try, and, try and see things in it yeah you're like a you're like a palantir it's 100% yeah it's I'm going Lord full, of the Rings energy. full Lord of the Rings that's how I come up with these great ideas this is genuinely the geekiest <laughs> shit I have ever yeah, in my mind no 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 look it's, there's an audience for it I don't know if we'll, this will reach them but someone will like it it's not just you and me I promise yeah 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 I promise um so <laughs> But you're you're obviously distilling other things besides gin as well. Yes. On top of this. Yes. So, so. What, what else are you distilling? And you're not spilling trade secrets, and you're not giving away future products. Mm. But because we because we can add other things. Yeah, yeah. We can. Yeah, yeah we can we'll cut just add it all out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll be like, Beautiful. you're gonna soundbite me. Um, um, I am gonna soundbite you. For <laughs> yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, but no, so yeah, probably the bulk of the rest of our time is uh, is made up of uh, distilling brandy at the moment. Mm. So. Uh, we're taking in quite a bit of wine from a bit of all over the place and uh, and working that through the stills basically whenever they're not making our products that we're you know bringing to market immediately they're they're working on brandy so we're looking to get yeah. as much barrel down as we kind of can you know which is pretty exciting yeah. we've got our... do you actually do you actually like distilling brandy do, or like or like sorry i'm <laughs> i'm not i'm not gonna put you on the spot no i hate it fucking... i hate this <laughs> yeah, get me out <laughs> <laughs> please i please yeah. i'm i'm in a prison it's more just like you you know you said that applewood gin was your was your favorite gin and mm. i love that you say that in a completely non self-serving way and i i do love that um but you said applewood gin is your favorite gin but then brandy must have been pretty that must have been a bit of a learning curve and like do you enjoy it as much as you enjoy distilling gin or is there a different way that um i suppose you appreciate it or or come to approach brandy yeah, yeah. So it's interesting because it kind of flies directly in the face of the thing that I like most about gin, I guess, and that it's this kind of ready assembled expression. I really enjoy distilling the brandy at the moment because it is kind of, particularly because we're not always using our wines, we're taking our wines from elsewhere. It's a little bit of like making something out of what you've been given. Um, so it's kind of like an interesting challenge in that regard. Also, I actually really like the flavour, and this is a bit perverse, um, of like unaged wine spirit, like eau de vie, which I know isn't like, okay. that's a bit of, it's a bit of a hot take. Uh, what are, what a, are the flavours, wait, what are the flavours of eau de vie for you? 
for me, oh, I think it's just like this really interesting kind of sweet, like has like a, an esteriness that I think is really quite interesting. There's different levels of kind of fruit yeah. to grassiness. I just think it's really nice. Kind of reminiscent of agave spirit sometimes, which like okay. I know we've hinted that twice, but I don't have like an agave obsession. It's more just like something I associate it with, um, which I think like the, the range of it, but also like you're looking for, I guess, particularly because we're, aiming to eventually make a product out of this that's going to be cohesive. It's like you're looking for necessary kind of like markers within it that are going to be somewhat common threads and are kind of indicators of where the distillation is at. And I think that's quite mm. fun. Do you, by where the distillation is at, do you mean like the terroir of the distillation or the quality of the distillation? Like what, what specifically? Oh, like, sorry, more specifically in terms of like qual- quality of distillation and like, uh, and like where our cut points should be and like necessarily like what we're uh, <laughs> like, yeah, in some regards, the, um, and trying to, and this is a bit that I'm like really haven't got you know much experience in is kind of envisioning where that's going to end up post aging. So I like to think that if you put good stuff in the barrels, you'll get good stuff out, and so I'm trying to make good stuff now. Um, and I guess in a couple of years' time, we'll see if that's necessarily the case or not. Uh, yeah, which is another exciting aspect of it, is that like you know I'm like it's good now. We'll see in a few years. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a, real, there's a real patience element to, to distilling brandy, which you don't get with gin, like mm. gin, because we, and, and also like most gins, and this is probably something that like a lot of people don't know, is that when you're distilling gin, you probably didn't like 99.9% of the time, you didn't distill the base ethanol that you're redistilling. And Correct. We're, we fall into that category as well. Yeah. And so what literally what you're doing is you're flavoring vodka. For, like if like there was a layman out there who knew nothing about distillation or or, or gin gin distillation, we literally mm. say you you are flavoring vodka. And so you can distill in the morning and bottle it in the evening. I mean, that's the old uh, that you can't actually do that, but that is the old adage. Yeah. For gin. And then it means that for brandy and and I want your take on this because you're the person who's doing it, you know, day in and day out. Is there a kind of, do you feel like a little bit frustrated that you can't taste it now? Is there like this, a bit of FOMO that comes out of having to put something in a barrel and having to wait and having to be patient? Or do you feel like that's actually teaching you something? Do you feel like it's like, nah, this is giving me like something I need in terms of perseverance and patience and persistence, the, the three P's as I'm going to go. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Them. I like that, yeah, yeah. Which you were always re- reeling off about the three P's, man. You're not oh, talking about. I don't, st- I don't shut up about <laughs> the three P's. I tell you what. Might, might rename the podcast. The podcast could be oh, renamed. Oh, fourth, yeah. fourth, fourth, fourth P the podcasting. Fourth, fourth P. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Jesus. 100%. Yeah, I love it. Um, but yeah, uh, I think it is kind of an interesting exercise in, uh, in letting something grow as opposed to making something happen. And I'm like, um, I guess kind of one of the things I really like and that's why i kind of in a more general sense going into distillation is a really like making stuff and that's like what excites me and like that's why i was bad at serving customers but good at making drinks <laughs> making stuff um so to make something but then you have to kind of let it grow is i think quite interesting and i think it's yeah it's kind of like i'm not a gardener but i think i imagine that's what people are quite like about gardening is you you watch it oh, that's probably what parents really enjoy too i'd say i'd like and it's being a parent as someone who has no yeah. kids yeah <laughs> okay do, do you do you genuinely think about it like that though like you're making you're making a baby i know that this is <laughs> now maybe this let's is, not get into the details mate let's not get into details yeah. <laughs> um yeah no i don't think it's bees, quite that birds intense brandy mate birds bees mm. brandy. but <laughs> do you do you feel like you are kind of watching watching something that you put a lot of passion, a lot of verb into kind of grow and change. And, and there's a sense of like, you don't have any control over that as well. Yeah. hundred percent. Like it's going to, it's uh, once it's in the barrel, we can you know, move the barrel around and we can pick when we reckon it's grown enough. But aside from that, it's just whatever happens is going to happen. And like, I think that's yeah. pretty, pretty exciting if a little bit nerve wracking. Um, but also, yeah, it's kind of, it's, but it's, it's cool. Like, it's like why you have a friggin' Tamagotchi, you go back and check on it every day. I actually never had Tamagotchi. I assume they grow like the yeah, little, this is the nerdiest, this is the nerdiest. Podcast. Nah, come on, man. We're, I'm 28. Everyone world. that you're speaking to is right in the same wheelhouse of Tamagotchi love. Uh, yeah, Tamagotchi, yeah, yeah, for sure. It's hot. It's a Absolutely. hot toy. Um, but yeah, so effectively you're going back to checking on something, seeing what's going on yeah. with it and yeah, it's going to, it's going to grow. And I think that's yeah. kind of cool. Well, speaking of Tamagotchis, you were recently in Japan. Oh, hell yeah. Oh, nice, dude. Excellent segue. I was like, where's he going to land this Tamagotchi plane? 
I was. I was just in Japan. Yeah, you yeah, were just was, in Japan. Mm, How was, it was a quick that? One. How was being in Japan? Oh, it was epic. It was um, we've been kind of we'd been just before the pandemic slash during the start of the pandemic a few years ago, which was which is awesome. And we did like a bit more of a, a round trip of, of the country. While this one was like, we have a couple of friends that are working uh, up, up in Huckover for a snow season. Uh, so we went to uh, go see them. So it was effectively a bit more of a, a bit more of a snowboarding and, um, and partying kind of adventure than, uh, oh. than necessarily the cultural deep dive that we'd done a few years ago. So, okay. Yeah, so it was it was a lot of fun. It was really it was pretty awesome. And we did happen to have a good night in Tokyo and go to a couple of cool bars, um, which was great. Oh, awesome. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. Did you um, uh, did you like run into anything like any flavors wise or any uh, ingredients wise that you were like inspired by over there, which you'd never seen before, or was it all like for you? You you kind of seen it before in terms of like yuzu or sudachi, Japanese citruses. For those of you who were listening, um. Uh, had you kind of run into those flavors before or did you did you run into anything that you were like oh, wow this is insane we got to bring this back i did a little bit like uh i tried, I tried some really awesome sake which is pretty interesting which obviously is kind of mm-hmm. as you go and that kind of we went to this bar called um which i don't know if we can name bars on here but we went yeah, to this place bars, called dude. yeah we went to this place called the bellwood um which is part of the sg group over in tokyo they some of their, their cocktail list is set out uh into the, like effectively four courses, which replicate the tradition of Japanese meal, which I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of. Um, but effectively one of those courses is rice. Um, so all of their drinks incorporated a, a rice element. So there's all these kind of different different varieties of, of rice and, and rice preparations being used, which I thought were really, really cool. And I thought could have pretty, I don't know if that's directly applicable to distillation, but I just thought they were really quite, I guess, unique to the place and I thought they kind of added a, added some really interesting particularly textual elements um which I was, I was yeah super super excited by are you is this your like short form way of telling me that you're about to start you know vacuum distilling sake uh mm, I don't know how well that would oh, go oh, oh. <laughs> oh, uh, no, it is it is uh, I'm not going to say necessarily. There is some sake out in the distillery at the moment, which I'm just, uh, it's its part of the potions. But I don't know. I don't know whether it's going to be distilled or if that's going to be blended in or what we're going to do with that or if I'll just drink it. Um, okay. But yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's definitely on the radar. But no, it was it was really, it was honestly some pretty pretty mind blowing stuff, which is great because you go to, it's tough because the beers are so cheap. You know? It's tough to it's tough to put yourself out there and find some, you know, cocktails and stuff like that. So I was, I was stoked to find some. Cheap. The beer's just so cheap. I'm going to miss beers. Um, but no, I'll, I'll start to find some really exciting and inventive cocktails over there and uh, some interesting use of local ingredients. Oh, awesome, man. Yeah, hell yeah. Yeah. yeah um, now, speaking of like distilling sake, mm. we've, we've touched on the fact that you've distilled brandy, you've distilled gin. Is Have you distilled something like what you've distilled whiskey before as well, right? No, I haven't actually. I've never distilled whiskey. Oh, cool. We did that um, just before my, my you know, trip just out the back. your tenure. Yeah, yeah, before they put me away from the customers for good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sick. Do do you do you do you actually want to make whiskey eventually? Would you want to distill whiskey? Would you want to distill another type of spirit? I definitely want to distill more types of spirit, um, but I don't know how much of that is like just professional curiosity, I guess, and like. I've done a, a bit of education in terms of, you know, the science of distilling. So I'd like to, you know, test it out and do the thing. And I think that would be really exciting. I don't know if there's like, it's tough because obviously they let me play around it here quite a lot. And I kind of could just do do for the most part what I like. But if we can do something as big as doing like a mash and a, and a wart and, and all of that to then make a whiskey, it's a, it's a big project. And it's one that we'd have to kind of, the marketing aspect and the, the uh, I guess, how sellable it is would have to come into play a little bit, which I know we sold the last one really well, but obviously the Australian whiskey market's uh, thickened up a little bit since then as well. Um, yeah. But, yeah, it, it definitely interests me. I, I want to, uh, and, and, you know, by the time it's all said and done, I want to have done all of it. I want to have made an agave spirit. I want to have, you know, made some shochu. I want to have made some whiskey. I want to have done, yeah, basically. Yeah. Just because it's exciting and I like to learn. Will that, will that mean that like you you want to like go and do like you want to go and travel to another distillery and work for another distillery like in the future yeah yeah in the future I, <laughs> in, a, in a perfect world yes uh i eventually would like to kind of travel around and, and and work a little bit overseas and and see how they do things over there and get some hands-on experience in like a i guess like a, a place that is like oh, i don't know how to say it but it's like you know go to a the place where they 
do the thing specifically, like whether that be making cognac in cognac or making, you know, whiskey in Scotland or whether it be, you know, what have you. Like it's – and like in the in the same way that we make Native Australian flavoured gin here, this would be the place to come and do that. So if I want to do something else, it would potentially be cool to do that over in those places and bring that experience potentially hopefully back here if they'll, you know, yeah. keep having me around. Oh, mate, always. Yeah. <laughs> um, always, no, 100%. Um, but – that kind of leads me to a question that I've actually wanted to ask you for a really long time, which is what, what inspires you to distill what you distill? Like, where do you receive your creative, your creative inspiration from? Um, kind of a little bit all over the place. Like it's, you know, it's obviously, I'm not going to say it's all me coming up with all these ideas and, and doing all that. Like it's largely a collaborative effort between like, you know, you, me, a gear, get Brendan and Lauren in the mix, you know, it's like, it's a, it's a, there's a, there's more, you know, we're all cogs in the one idea machine. Uh, but like, take inspiration from like cooking a little bit, like, you know, just see different flavor combinations, uh, experiencing cocktails that I've had. Um, but then also like, I guess you, well, I'm not going to say you, I'm going to say me, cause I don't know if everyone thinks the same way. Um, but like you kind of build this catalog of flavors in your head, I guess, of different things that you've tried and different elements of those things and what things are like other things. And then when you have something new presented to you, like, you know, saying that it has a bit of a musky element to it, obviously it's just relating it to something else that you have. And then you think about how previous things have come together in the past. And then I like to think about kind of putting together the pieces of the puzzle in a way that's not going to make the same picture. It's going to make something new and exciting with similar building blocks, but maybe different building blocks have different elements. And I guess that's kind of how I think about flavors and yeah. ideas, so which is a bit vague. Kind of related. No, 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 but it's kind of related to like, um, like a memory library in many ways. Yeah, hundred percent. That's and that's but, kind of how I think about flavors, just in general. Yeah. It's like yeah. So you you literally do you do you like do you visualize a library? Like, how do you visualize it when you're when you're tasting and when you're noticing something that you've had before? Does it form kind of a visual place in your mind? Do you think about it in in pictures, or do you do you just remember where you were? It, like, how is it linked? in your own memory? Uh, I'm not really so much a picture thinker as a word word thinker, to be honest with you. Weird, weird yeah. as that sounds, I think of, I think of the words and oh, things for the so most part. Because cool, I'm such a picture guy. Yeah, yeah, like, I, you know, if you say the word ball to me, I think of what the word ball looks like instead of a ball for some reason. Um, okay. But, yeah, so that's that's kind of how it's organised in my head, so it's a bit more of like a, like a book, I guess you could say, of, of things. Mm. And, yeah, and then I'll, I guess, you once you have that first thought of, and I think you're always going to trust your first instincts when you try stuff. I don't know if you feel the same way about, like, if you try something, you have it, it first hits you, like, oh, that's absolutely smacking of, you know, like a Sunday afternoon kind of a rosé kind of vibe. Like, oh, is this giving me a little bit of strawberries and cream? Uh, mm. And then you analyse it more and you're like, oh, no, no, no. I think you kind of got to trust that first thing for some, because I think that is typically where the truest kind of impression is made of something. Um, and then if you take that and then, I guess, look at your catalogue, of things that you've had with those flavors and those sensations and the, even like the emotions attached to those things. And then from there, they'll help you branch out to then see what else goes with what. Yeah. So do you feel like, so I know the guys at Cantina OK, like um, uh, Jeremy specifically at Cantina OK, for those of you who don't know, Cantina OK is a, uh, well, one of the world's best bars. It's a phenomenal mezcal and tequila bar in the heart of Sydney CBD and Jeremy Blackthorne, uh, the head of that bar once coined it emotional tasting as the best way to taste spirit. So in a cool. way where your subjectivity and your, your personal story and your personal history and your personal uh, flavor memories actually are put front and center when it comes to tasting spirit, as opposed to um, maybe how we do it in wine through like a Wesset lens where we have an agreed upon nomenclature to talk about wine. Um, mm. Jeremy was really fundamentally, I think, opposed to structured tasting and instead mm. wanted people to taste with and bring themselves to the tasting table. Do you, do you feel like that's a really good way to do it? And is that how you do it as well? Uh, I think it is an excellent way to do it. Uh, and I definitely think that's, yeah, you've put that really, really quite excellently. Um, but yeah, I think that's a, a great way to taste spirits. And, it, and I think it's a great way to experience beverages in general and slash things, but that's, you know, taking it to a bit of a broader sense. Um, mm. But yeah, I would say that 
while in like my line of work you do have to look at it from like a bit of a broader and more objective sense from time to time i think when you're trying to build something good you got to first look at is it good for you like do you like it because if you don't like it no one else is going to like it so, <laughs> so yeah you know you can't so you got to build for, you got to build it from like that aspect and also i guess it's like that's what makes it you know gives it some personality as well yeah and makes it per- well makes it unique to how you distill as our distiller and i think mm. you can see you can see a massive change like if you're if you're listening to this for the first time and you know you've not had applewood gin in you know 3 or 4 years i would highly encourage you and i'm i'm yeah come back buy, buy. <laughs> no it's not so much like buy it again i would i would i would urge you to try Mitch, like I'm trying to think of like how how old the bottles would have to be for Applewood Gin to be your distillation of Applewood Gin in the true sense, like not mm. not in the not in the oh I've inherited this and as we were talking before, like you've stepped into some pretty big shoes and you're just following the recipe to now you really fully owning it and producing what I believe is is I I think the most unique gin um, to speak of australian gin like our our gin from what you distill is a fundamentally australian gin and that's really really exciting because i don't think anyone else is doing that i think a lot of people talk about how oh well they've got the best gin or they've got the most refreshing gin and i Mm. I don't like to use that terminology i like to think that what you create is an incredibly unique perspective and reflection of both, both native Australian ingredients, but also gin in general. Like, I, and I think that's really quite, quite wonderful. That's really kind of you to say, Matt. Appreciate that. Um, and I get, yeah, I'm choked up, Matt. <laughs> this isn't a, this isn't a friendship podcast, man. We'll save this for the private call. Um, oh, okay. but no, I appreciate that. <laughs> but no, I think that's kind of something that, that, not just me, but we do. I think that's pretty interesting. Like, I think it's become relatively commonplace to use australian botanicals which is awesome that's fantastic but i think that making a gin in a style that is australian yes it's fully i fully realized thing and it's like it's something that we push out as hard as we can so in that following on from that what do you feel is is next for australian distilling then from your perspective being an australian distiller creating an unashamedly australian product like what what do you feel is next for Australian spirits? Are, are, are there any, is there anything that you're worried about? Is there anything that you're excited about? And like, yeah, what do you believe is like the next 10 years and what does that look like? Man, I have such a bad sense of these kind of things. Uh, and because in why, terms of why like, do you have oh, such a bad sense? Oh, cause like I work in the industry, but I'm like, not like a, a super, um, I guess networking kind of person who has like an ear to the ground at the industry particularly well. I kind of just hang out up yeah. here. Um, which is, you know, not always the best thing to do when you're making bold predictions for 10 years. Um, mm. But I guess the things that I am worried about is that we're hitting definitely a bit of a market saturation point. That even if that's even made its way out the back to me, I can kind of hear that a little bit. That uh, mm. there's there's like a lot of gin on the market, a lot of gin made here, which is awesome. It's so good, and so and I would say the bulk of it is really really excellent. But we're hitting a point where it's going to be tough to, for consumers to make differentiations. Slash, there's just going to be too much product on the market. Um, so I think there's going to be a skewing away from gin. We're obviously betting big on the next thing being brandy. If we're gonna if we're gonna pick one, which I guess does make sense from the standpoint that obviously there's so much wine produced, particularly in SA, um, which lends itself quite well to to becoming a bit of a brandy production hub. And obviously we've got Saint Agnes here, and those guys have been doing it for for eons, and they're so so good at it. Um, so that's, and I guess the thing that I would, I'm excited about is that like, despite, you know, I think the, the oversaturation of gin, I think there's a really good opportunity for kind of less strictly categorized spirits and spiritist products, I guess, like alcoholic products, whether that be like weird vermouths or like, you know, kind of some of the stuff that we're doing with our aperitif range and things like that. I think that's where kind of the more daring and exciting opportunities might lie in terms of recategorizing spirits and kind of branching into new territory that isn't necessarily already been explored, which I think is really, really exciting. Um, so that's something I'm yeah, I guess excited about, but not worried about. And then, uh, and then yeah, hopefully, hopefully the rise of brandy, but it will be the rise of something. It's just going to be a matter of what the thing is. Yeah, that's, the, that's my best guess. It's, what do you think? 
What what are your predictions for the next ten years, my friend? Man, it's a really good question. I think from my perspective, the biggest thing that's going to change, especially surrounding Australian spirit, is unfortunately there's going there's going to be less of us, but we are going to be bigger. Mm. So those who can create an economy of scale, those who can tell a differentiated message can, I think, demonstrate both in the liquid and also in their story why you should pick them and why you should drink their product and something that's compelling are going to be the the gins which people and the spirits that people love. Mm. I think that that will be the determining factor in this kind of uh, spirits bubble we have at the moment in Australia. And it is a bubble that we have just in Australia. It's not a bubble that we have all over the world. And we can see that from the data as well. So uh, we can see that there's been a decline in consumption of gin domestically, but there's been a rise of the consumption of gin globally Mm. by 5.3% this year. So it's a domestic problem as opposed to an international problem. And I think therein lies the solution for a lot of Australian distillers. It's going to be, and this is, it's, I mean, it's circles and roundabouts um, when we talk about this, because this has happened to so many Australian industries that have reached a saturation within a domestic market. A lot of them then look overseas And then suddenly our culture is being fed back to us, but by the lens of people who've consumed those products overseas rather than consuming them in Australia. And then we enter into that feedback loop again. So I think that that is what's on the horizon. I think we're about to see a global definition and a global modern definition of what Australian culture is through the lens of wine and spirits. And I think that that for me is both, it's both things. It's what I'm worried about. And it's also what I'm really excited about at the same time, Mm -hmm. Um, because I think there's such a powerful story to tell agriculturally and culturally through Australian spirits as the vehicle um, that no one else can tell. And I think it's a compelling story that we should bring to the world. And it just sucks that um, the reason that the catalyst for, for us to even follow through on it is economic rather than rather than this like beautiful passionate verve it's yes. like a little bit fear drive my feet rather than <laughs> passion lead me um yeah. and so that's why it's both things for me it's mm. it's the thing that i'm most worried about is the fact that i think we're about to have a, a dynamic shift in terms of where australian spirits are sold most Um, And it's not going to be in Australia anymore. It's going to be overseas. Um, But I'm also most excited about that because it's a beautiful gift that we can give the world that only we can give. So yeah, that's what I'm most excited about. And that's, that's kind of my prediction for the next 10 years. I think we're going to see that play out um, Mm -hmm. on the global, on the grand scale. Um, And it's going to be, it's going to be an interesting ride. Like it's a, maybe. a real interesting ride. Yeah, mm. because the other thing that comes out of the back of that democratization of Australian flavors is the democratization of their ingredients. And what mm. I mean by that is the largest plantation of finger limes in the world is not in Australia. The, larger, the largest plantation of macadamias is not in Australia. The largest plantation of Geraldton wax is not in Australia. So these ingredients because of their popularity through various different industries get brought and taken overseas and Mm. they kind of lose their, they lose their terroir. They lose that beautiful sense of place. And I think that's something that spirits in Australia can learn from the wine industry, which is how do we protect our geographical indication? Um, Mm. And we've seen that done with, uh, you know, with things like Scotch whiskey, We've seen yeah. Australian, a whole nother podcast oh. talking about yeah, how we can, how we can stratify basically an AOC or a DOC or a geographical indicator for mm. Australian spirits in a way that actually adds value to the industry and doesn't prohibit people from joining it. Uh, yeah. It should incentivize basically making it 
something that's only accessible by the by the few. Mm. Um, so I just think that's another that's another ten years away. I think, but I think it's a really exciting ten years that we'll see play out. So that's that's what I think. I think yours is probably more on the money than mine. But uh... no, I don't. No, I disagree. I think you just approach it from a, a different perspective because you know you're you're the person actually doing what I like to call the steel cap work. Um, oh man, I've got which, one right now. I can't get my I know you do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> As we said before in our safety briefing, you got Always. to have them on. Hundred percent on. Always. Always, man. Yeah. Well, look, Mitch. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. I know you probably have a distillation to get back to. Uh, I really, I really appreciate your time and have a really good rest of your day. Matt, always happy to talk with you. Thank you very much for having me on. Matt, always. Enjoy. Catch you Enjoy later. Enjoy your day too, mate. Absolutely.